So first I wanted to be a fighter and then Sage Northcott got signed to the UFC. And when I saw him, I'm like, who the f- how can someone be that jacked? And that, like, <laughs> this is not- I'm like, I'm not fighting these kids. The promoter, his job is to get people to watch and pay and then the athletes get paid. So as an athlete, you're a product. I have a store, in the store I have products. And then we have winning products. Winning products attract people and they buy them. So they're more valuable. If it sucks, that's good. It's good, it sucks. It means you gotta do more. You gotta go harder. That competition that you deal with, that's good. It means you gotta learn all these skills. You gotta get through the whole process. Your confidence as a person comes from facing those difficulties and coming out on the other side. When I see this dude, no mustache, just beard, yeah. this guy's not trying to get laid. He doesn't give two shit to a style, you know what I mean? He's yeah. trying to smack a bitch, you know? Like, they, 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 these guys are scary, man. I see them around now and I'm like, bro. Yeah, because it's an English thing, right? English people don't wear an oversized. No, no, they don't. No, like we don't, we don't wear an oversized. It's more of an American thing, I think. Yeah. But yeah, no, I got it. And I'm just like a little bore, mate. So I love it, you know? Yeah, I was going to say, he is, he is quite oversized, Joe. So it works very well. <laughs> it's comfortable, man. Once you go oversized, it's hard to go back. You know, having a shirt tucked in your armpits and like you're sweating over time and shit. Yeah. I can't do it. Like I, I, I moved on a long time ago and I'm not going back. Now I take this same shirt and I cut it off. See this? Yeah, I like that. Yeah, no, I like it. You know, I think I've got that one. I think I've got that one coming. I think I've got that yeah. exact top well, coming. Th- this is this is me. This, this is my. But one. you've yeah, but you've cut it off. Yeah. Have you actually taken a pair of scissors to that, or did you actually have like the manufacturing team remove the arms? No, nah, that's like, bro. Like my people are so <laughs> mad because I I get these shirts and I start chopping them off and shit, you know. And I'm because like I live in very warm places, right? Like yeah. Thailand, sway as fuck. And I'm, I'm, you know, I got creative with this stuff when I started cutting my pants. I started like cutting my pants, making them shorts. I was like, this shit is good. It's fantastic. You know, like, I'm, I'm, <laughs> like all these uh, pants and trousers that, that are old, all of a sudden now they're back, you know, in business. They're back, so. baby. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I can get on board with that, mate. If you don't mind me cutting shit up in the summer. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, man, and I'm shameless. Like when I cut stuff, I start like I start somewhere, and then I start chopping them down, down all the way. Like my shirt almost feel like a crop top, you know. Uh, it's got so much airflow going on, you know. Uh, I'm 38 now, and let me tell you, you don't get, you don't get like, you, you don't go down like with, with your comfort standards. You don't go back. You just start getting more and more comfortable. Mate, I'm my with shorts you. I'm with you. Way up now. Mate, you don't see me out of a out of a pair of trackies really these, these days. You know what I mean? I never wear a pair of jeans. I, I I've got one pair I think left. I haven't worn them about a year. I don't think. <laughs> when are we When are we going to see ex martial slippers for the for the UK audience? Then, mate, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's what we need. Forget the sliders, mate. Give us some slippers. Hell yeah, baby. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll get you that. Just wait for the sun <laughs> to come out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah never yeah we've we've had our day this year mate it's gone now for about six months so so no chance of that hey grapplers we are now sponsored by x marshall x marshall have sent us some new quality british design rash guards these are just the british designs but they do do loads and loads of really cool designs you know they've got the only fans ones they've got the hillbilly ones they got the porn hub ones they got all the all the <laughs> yeah game of chokes they got they got all that sort of stuff which to be honest you just don't see anywhere else yeah 100 percent. and they also specialize in not just no gi but also muay thai as well so if you're cross training and you want to pick up some thai boxing shorts and uh, that's the place to go as well. Genuinely, really do like them. I think they're uh, they feel really nice. That's what I like about them. They feel really nice. They got the band at the bottom, you know. And uh, yeah, I've took them for a spin, and and they they sweat up quite nicely. And better yet, guys, we've managed to secure a really good discount for our audience. So if you use our link below, then you get an automatic fifteen percent off of everything on their website. Get that up, look, so they can see that shit. So Joe, we're live. We're live, my man. So uh, so welcome. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much for having me. This is a an honor here because you guys got on some like 
top guys. You know, you got Brandon McCatherin, so J Rod in there, Jordan teaches, uh, one of our affiliates for a long time. You know, so it's it's nice to be here. You know, it's a pleasure to have you, mate. And uh, you know, we we've been making some great progress, getting some really good guests on, and obviously uh, you and the team of very Connie started supporting us now. So thank you very much, and that's going to allow us to, to get to new heights. Yeah, man, it's uh, it's an honor. It's it's fun doing this, you know. Like having people like you guys. I I've been watching your stuff recently, and uh, it's fun, you know. A couple of dudes like you got blue belt, you know. That is like just you know new to the game, which is it's always fun having new guys, you know, a new blood, you know. That I'm I'm a Muay Thai guy too. Like I I started doing jujitsu when I started twelve years ago. I did jujitsu like and Muay Thai at the same time. Yeah, and then. Kind of Muay Thai picked up and I forgot about Jiu Jitsu. And uh, now I'm back, but you know, I'm like a white belt. I, I'm not ranked. <laughs> I just move around. I'm like a good white belt, you know, like a white belt with a spaz, you know. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> it's how I started in Jiu Jitsu, actually. I, I started with Muay Thai. So I boxed growing up and then I did Muay Thai for a couple of years. And this was probably going back like 20 years ago now. So I'm a little bit older than you. And when I was doing Muay Thai at the gym, there were some um, grapplers and jiu-jitsu guys, or they, they were cage fighters back then. And I started cross-training and they kept taking me down and beating me up. So uh, so that's how I ended up doing jiu-jitsu. So uh, my roots are in Muay Thai as well. So uh, I love that. <laughs> yeah, it's no, it's no joke in jiu-jitsu and no gi. I feel like Muay Thai translates somewhat to no gi, like the explosiveness and whatnot. And I love the, like, my, my, my style in jiu-jitsu, it's, it's like I got like first attack. Like I, I don't have the steps. I got one step. If it works good, if it doesn't work, I'm going to just try to defend or something and just be annoying, <laughs> you know. But I normally try to go for a guillotine, you know, right off the bat, you know, like or jump on something, which is kind of Muay Thai thing, right? It's, mm. it's more explosive. And um, it catches jiu-jitsu guys off guard, you know. And, and, and I use the frames, I use the clinch frame a lot, you know, and just like, just be annoying and such. It works if someone's like my size or smaller and they're not very strong. But today I got like schooled at Bang Tao, you know, I just <laughs> came from Bang Tao and uh, it's a machine. Like I said, it's just like you got almost four buildings in one, you know, and um, 30 trainers at once, like. Every um, that's mental. Huh? Every space has like ten or twelve trainers. Yeah, that's incredible. I feel like with that Muay Thai background, though, you're the sort of white belt that's probably going to try and can open a somebody from the guard, right? <laughs> get that, get that, get that like tight clinch going inside the guard. <laughs> Boy, whatever I can get my hands on, you know, like I'm, I'm, I'm pretty bad, but you know, I, I got, I, so I rolled with this dude today from Denmark or something like that, and um. You know, jiu-jitsu guys got different strength, you know, like their their strength is, it's a ligament thing or whatever it is. We're mongs, mate, basically. Yeah, <laughs> you know, like whatever you think, and, and some of them seem really skinny, right? It looks skinny and, you know, but they're screwdrivers, you know, and just, it's so hard to work with. So I got a nice humble buy and, and, uh, um, and then I did trying to do Muay Thai. I was gassed completely gas and um you know i'm 38 trying to get in shape now and um you know fuck it it's, it's gonna take a while you know I, I need a lot more push-ups that i'm doing right now so yeah <laughs> yeah and so is the plan to stay in uh, in thailand for a little while or are you kind of on on route to somewhere else where you're going to continue the training that is a great question because a lot of people when they ask me this i don't have a really good answer you know and it sounds like it's it's not normal right like not to have answer where where you where you live where do you live I don't have an answer for it, you know, because I don't <laughs> actually live anywhere, you know. Um, so what happened was uh, last year we were doing the Dojo Road Show. You guys were talking with Dean, me, Dean, T, three people. We bought an RV, painted it, Dojo Road Show, X Marshall, and we just went across America. Mate, that must have been so fun. That must have been amazing. If you do that yeah, next well, time, mate, we'll pack up a podcast and we'll get people in the van doing podcasts yeah. while we're driving around. Yeah, take us with. We'll We'd just get that. the head coaches and then we'll do something like we'll fit out the back of the van and then they can beat me up in the back of the van and we can talk about how they beat me up. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun. It was so fun. The whole thing started so random. We 
flew to America from Mexico. I was living in Mexico for like two years doing like a, I had like a, a, a fight camp in there, you know, like I had an office. The office has mats and we would like work, do sets of like push-ups, 500 push-ups a day, 500 crunches, 500 jumping squats and shit while working. So we work after an hour, we do one set of like push-ups, jumping squats. Oh, oh. So when Dean showed up, uh, I met Dean at a bar in Mexico, right? <laughs> um, and uh, we just got, you know, we were having so much fun for like a couple of months. And then he was like, what do you do? And he asked me this question like a few times, right? And, and I like explained it to him every time in a way, but it doesn't, didn't get it. And at some point he got it. He's like, oh, shit. You know, so you're doing something, you know, he thought I was just a degenerate running around. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was like, anyhow, I was like, hey, if, if you want a job, you know, let's talk. That my way of hiring is like, I try to like, obviously we got certain roles that you need real motherfuckers, like actually getting shit done. And then uh, uh, they're, they're, they're like, their roles, like for, first, like a high for an attitude, right? If, if you got the attitude, you can always learn the skill, you know? And, um, and then like, the, I'm trying to have a crew that I run around with because I move around so much. And it wastes a lot of time kind of meeting new people and such, you know? And uh, I'm like, if I can just, like, lock that one in so I don't, like, when I want to have fun, I don't have to, like, um, kind of outsource that and go out and meet people that I don't train with, I don't work with and whatnot. There isn't enough time in a day. You have random group, uh, 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 friend groups, you know? Like, I always had, like, people that I work with, then people I train with, and people that I actually party with, you know, and uh, they were completely separate. And the people that I party with, they don't want to hear about my work or training. And people that I work with, they don't want to hear about my, you know, party time. So I, I, was, I, I thought about it and I'm like, you know what, what if I create a setup that I have same people I work with, train with, and travel with? And I was like, Okay, what, what do we? What, what do I need to do, right? If I hire in for certain roles, you know, some roles you need to be in front of a computer like seven, eight hours a day, you know, just a regular job. I can't do that, you know. I can't have him just sitting on a computer. So I was like, I I need to find a role that is like flexible and it's not, um, and also they kind of fit the criteria of you know, like I can hang out with you know and not want to <laughs> choke out, you know. So. <laughs> Uh, Dean fit the script, you know, really cool guy. And uh, anyhow, we got him on board. And in that office that I created in uh, uh, Mexico, we would work and train. And then we would like do podcasts at night and, you know, and have people over. And, and it was so good. We had like one of the best business growth during that period. And uh, you know, I, I know a lot of people, you know, like there's a lot of jujitsu brands, you know, and like most guys, like when they get to blue belt, they start a jujitsu rash guard company, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> you know? I don't want to dim. It's not, it's not that crazy. You know, I don't want to dim, but, uh, uh, the way we kind of went about it, it was like, I, I really wanted to create a real thing, you know, like it wasn't. You know, I, I went to school, I did my master's in business and shit like that, but that didn't really translate to business, really. But uh, what I'm trying to get to is I was like, I was all in on that. I was like, I got to create a business that it's um, in my passion and it's remote and I can just like move around. And um, uh, so the, the, the way I went about this company, it was a lot more... Uh, um a, a lot more serious you know like we are like working out some insane business strategies you know and marketing stuff and there's a lot of grind really behind you know uh this thing and, and and it grew a lot faster than i anticipated that it you know so uh the way i wanted to kind of have people around me i wanted to make sure they understand this this is not a joke this is not like you know, th this is how I make my living and this is how I travel. And this is how, you know, like we got like 12 people on a team. So 
uh, that office uh, theory was like, and it's, it's such an important and interesting uh, theory, like to, to have people that you go out with, you work with, you train with, right? Because a lot of times creative ideas don't come during work. It comes like when you're hanging out at a bar or like you're in a restaurant shooting shit. And you're like, oh, we should do this. We should do that. And that's how the um, Dojo Roadshow, the U.S. tour started. We were actually hanging out. And I'm like, we got a lot of gear in America and we have a lot of athletes. What do we do? I'm like, let's fly, get an RV, drive around, go to different gyms, meet our athletes and do giveaways. And, you know, make some challenges, like friendly challenges and whatnot. Cool. We fly to America. We land in L.A. Next day, we're hanging out with Eddie Bravo in a <laughs> restaurant. But, and, and Eddie Bravo is someone like, in 2010, I was listening to Joe Rogan when he first started. Same, yeah. He was the first ever podcast I listened to, Joe Rogan and um, Eddie Bravo. First one. I didn't yeah. even know what jiu-jitsu was. I didn't even know what it was. I thought he was just some crazy man talking about some blokes rolling around kind of gay. <laughs> and flat earth. <laughs> yeah, flat earth, yeah. yeah. Man, back then they had the flashlight as a sponsor. Good days. <laughs> <You know? laughs> they were shameless back then. It was yeah, fucking, yeah, yeah. it was fun. And because uh, I just I, I just moved to Canada back then and I didn't speak English. So that was my way of learning English. I was like, you know, you got your school, I learn I learn whatever I can there. But like to actually learn the, the pop culture, the what's going on in the you know, like how people actually talk. Uh, I was listening to Joe, but also I was just started, I just started my Muay Thai thing. So he just happened to have that perfect combo of Muay Thai, uh, of fighting and comedy. And I love comedy. I have like fighting and comedy. This is what I like to do, you know, in my free time, like watch comedy. I don't watch movies, regular action movies. I don't watch any of that. You know, it's either documentary or comedy, you know. So Joe had that and I was like, oh, man, I got I, I locked in really hard, you know, and it helped me a lot with my self-development and such, you know, like I, I, I really didn't know what the, what the hell was going on. I just moved from the Middle East. I didn't speak a language. And, uh, you know, back then I'm, I'm 38. Back then there was no like Facebook came out when I was in Canada. I was just like, like, bro. Like back then, like, you don't like people get their hands like the kids now on all this self-development and business and all that. You know, you guys probably learned a lot about podcasting from YouTube, right? Mm -hmm. Back then, like, there's nobody. It's just Joe Rogan telling you not to be a bitch, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Uh, then, uh, yeah, we were hanging out with Eddie Bravo. And the next day I was like, bro, this is too much fun. Why are we in Mexico? Like, we already done that. When we're done with this, it was a two-week thing. I'm like, we're flying back. We're buying an RV. We're doing this for a year. And uh, I'm living the dream. Mate, that honestly sounds like, we, we talk about it all the time, like traveling and doing podcasts is our ultimate aim, I think. And uh, yeah, you're, you're basically living that, mate. That's really fucking cool. It's really fucking Bro, cool. Bro, like, tra I'm doing the podcast. I think it will be super effective. One, the most creative you get, the more, the more amped up, like the, the most um, kind of, there is energy to like being in a new place. You know, when I take you and you just land in a new city, new country, there's that sense of like your body's telling you what the hell is going on here, you know, and you're tuned up, you know, and that is very good for your, uh, you know, like I always say this, you need to be excited in life. It doesn't matter yeah. what you do, you know, if you're not excited, um, n n everything is dull. It's so much is about what's going on here. You know, it's your perspective. It's not what's around you. You know, I always say this, you know, like uh, new experience is the best experience. Everyone know that. And traveling mm -hmm. gives you that in abundance, right? You're just getting new experience, everything you do, right? Taking the bus, walking, getting a restaurant. So, and, and that like, that is one of the main reasons why I'm traveling now. I did some research when I was like 35, and I'm like, man, once I got in my 30s, life started to pass by so fast. You know, I'm like, oh by the time I'm, I'm, I'm getting used to like 2022, it's 2023. I'm like, what the fuck is this? 
I'm like, hold <laughs> up. You know, like, this is too fast. Yo. And then you start thinking, like, you know, when here's the thing, right? And if you do it mathematically, when you are one year old, another year is half your life. Yeah. Right? So it's so long. One day is so long. You're napping 10 times. You wake up, fight with all your brothers, go do some shit, right? Like, and then when you're 30, right, it's one, one out of 30, right? So yeah. it starts, as you grow older, life starts passing so fast. When you're young, you think, oh, it's a long way ahead. But it's not. It's really, uh, it goes by so much faster. So I thought, I did some research on how to slow down time. And <laughs> I do it that random shit frequently. And um, I'm like, how, how, how can I get the most out of this? And then it turns out routine is a, a, a time killer. When you have like, you go to work, then, you know, you do whatever you want to, you do, you sleep, you go to work again the next day. That routine makes time pass by a lot faster. And um, if you think about it, if you look at last year, for example, what, you, what can you remember of last year? A birthday, a trip you did, like a right. couple of things like that is that stand out. You know, but the, the day to day stuff, it's like gone. Right. So I was like, all right, what do we do? So it was like, all right. So you got you want You want to take out the routine. I'm like, OK, uh, routine, however, is really good for, for development. If you want to work on project, you need routine. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but I was like, OK, so what do we do? And then I, you know, I did some more research. Turns out travel is one of the best ways to really uh, you're not slowing out slowing uh, down time but you're getting a lot more experience because it's not about time it's about how much you can get in it so uh yeah and that that was like 2000 uh, 2022 uh 2021 about that time uh and then I'm like, all right i'm out and i checked out went to uh mexico i did the the mexico thing and then i did the uh dojo rocho for a year from miami to um la but you know we austin uh vegas these are these are very very good places for jiu-jitsu and fighting in general la is huge for jiu-jitsu too and um after that um i flew to uh um I, I was in europe in the summer and then um i did the middle east i wanted to do a dojo rocho there as well but um I, I'm, I'm still kind of assessing that but then i was i had a china thing i flew to china to go to Canton Fair. You guys heard of it? You know what that is? No. It's, um, it's, it's probably a month and a half of all factories and suppliers of all kind of products go to one area. So if even if you don't have a business and you can't go and travel and check it out, to actually walk through the thing, it takes maybe five hours to just walk. <laughs> If you stop and ask questions, this is you're not going through one hole. One hole, it takes a whole day. And there is 11 holes, maybe 15 holes. Man, Chinese do it big. Oh, my God. It was huge. Oh, literally. And they fucking make everything. They're making everything really high. When you see it and you see what China is, you guys been to China? No, no, no mate, no. Bro. <laughs> they got it figured out there. <laughs> Forget about America. They electric cars. Thirty percent of cars there are electric. Whoa! All taxis are it? electric. Bro, they're way ahead. Way ahead. And this is like what, fifteen, maybe twenty years of like really becoming one of the top uh, boys. Mm -hmm. This is in twenty years, right? Like they've been around the game for like forty years doing good shit. And then like 20 years, they kicked it off a notch. And man, they got so much done in that very short period of time. So when I was there, I was like, holy, <laughs> you know, if you know, you know. They manufacture everything. I remember back in the day, I used to own game shops and we used to import all the PlayStation 3 controllers and put our, our shop name printed onto it. And then oh, they used yeah. to even like for like import taxes and stuff, they used to put on like different labels so that you didn't have to pay the like a thousand pound import <laughs> tax fee and stuff. It used to be so funny, <laughs> mate. They don't care, mate. They're just like speaking to some Chinese dude on, on Skype. I remember doing Google Translate on the computer <laughs> to him. <laughs> I used to make a little fortune out of that though. They used to make quite a lot of money out of that. 
<laughs> yeah, they're good, man. And the quality is really up there. Mate, too, that's what know? I was about to say. You couldn't even tell the difference. I used to sell hundreds of them because, you know, a PlayStation 3 controller back in the day was like 60 quid. And then I used to be able to import them for like 15 quid and then sell them for 35 quid all day long. Just boom. <laughs> I used to sell like 50 of them in a week on Christmas week. I used to love oh, it. business, baby. Yeah, let's go. Yeah, man, they got it all figured out. They, there's like maybe five different electric manufacturers there, like brands, like a Tesla thing. They got all kind of Teslas there running around. And they're just good, man. And, you know, here's the thing with the Chinese stuff. Yeah, it breaks, it breaks down after like 10, 15 years. That's good. You got what you like. You got you got the value for a really cheap price, and um, you know it doesn't have to last. Honestly, you don't want it to last fifteen years because it's completely different technology. Fifteen years from now, you don't want it around. Five years from now, so much changes. Now things are moving way too fast. You can't keep up with shit. You know. By the time we learned the internet, social media came about, you were like, all right, Facebook, whatever. Then Instagram, you're like, fuck Instagram. I'm not getting on that. And then it was like the biggest thing. You're like, yeah, oh, everyone fuck, is I'm on late. Instagram. Yeah. yeah. Mate, they, yeah. They, they, they cracked me up, man. They, cracked, they, they copy everything, don't they? They don't care about any sort of, like, you, you've seen the cars out there. They'll just, like, a BMW will bring out a brand new car and they'll just copy it <laughs> straight away. Just copy it and be like, yeah, this is our new whatever and just work back about half the price they, they do literally they even copy the blueprints and everything don't they it's like crazy yeah. it's crazy and they just don't care there's just no copyright laws there they just don't care yeah man uh it's it's very impressive and it's uh but they got everybody on check bruv they got cameras everywhere they know you you are a number and they fucking got you locked in like you fuck up once that's in your records forever ever you know, and if they want to catch you, they got you right away. Like, that's the thing. When you see China, you see the future of how things are moving. You know, and uh, it's not, you know, freedom of speech, all that cute shit, you know. It's not yeah. It's not going to work a few years from now, you know, because um, the, the, the things are like the the direction things are going. It's uh, it's very different, you know, and. Anyhow, let's not go there. <laughs> yeah. Especially the UK at the moment, mate. People are getting locked up for saying all sorts online. So, uh, yeah, it's definitely a hot topic here at the moment. Well, so. they do, I, don't, I don't know. I can't remember exactly what it is, but in China, aren't they doing some sort of identity thing where they can... They've got the uh, social credits, have Social they? credits, yeah. that's it, where it's like that thing yeah. off like Black Mirror, mate, where basically if you do well, they give you more. If, you, if, you, if you're caught like walking across the road, jaywalking, bro, bro. They'll, they'll take it away. And it's implemented, man. Implemented in many countries. Is so China, so there, here's my kind of little summary of it. You got America was, you know, big guns, right? They, and they were actually kind of pushing the world that direction, you know, like mm -hmm. freedom of speech, da, 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 whatever, right? Uh, the, you know, amendments or whatever they go. And then America now is a little bit slow and you got all these, um, the, the, you know, other countries, BRICS, I think now they, they, they kind of, you know, join force. And China is the big dog. And China just was like, hey, you see this America book? Throw this shit. Take this book. This is fun. <laughs> you know, no one can say shit with this. They were like, oh my God, this is amazing. <laughs> Fuck freedom of speech. Fuck human <laughs> rights. This is good. You know, like everybody in control. Yeah, man, I, it, it works really well for most countries, you know, like it works very well. They love it. They love the Chinese system. So it's not only a Chinese thing. Now it's, it's spreading, it's spreading all fast. I know. This, this is just a podcast, isn't it? That's it. That's it. Let's uh, talk for you while we can then, man. <laughs> but mate, I, I, I thought it was really interesting what you're saying about the, uh, the slowing time thing a minute ago. It was something yeah. that I'm really aware of because, as I say, I'm a little bit older than you and and I currently live quite a mundane life with a lot of routine. And year by year, I, I went through a period where I started writing down like achievements and things that I'd achieved because at the end of the year, I'd look back and, and you're right, I, I couldn't make, I couldn't pick out anything. So I think the fact that you're breaking that routine and traveling about a little bit, I think that makes real sense. And I think it's, it's quite difficult to do that, but obviously having like a good lifestyle business is, is a great way to achieve that as you've talked about. So I wanted to learn a little bit more, I guess, about how you came up with the idea of X Marshall and, and also where the name came from as well, because I've always been curious about that. Absolutely. Uh, so X Marshall is um, 
like growing up, I always loved martial arts. I was crazy about martial arts when I was a kid. You know, I watched a couple of Van Damme movies, you know, and um, trying to break bricks at home. And just, I was trouble. You know, I was fighting a lot in school. You know, I, I wasn't like uh, instigating fights, but it was like the fucking, you know, the, the police there, you know. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I was good at it. You know, I got I got checked a couple of times, you know. Particularly, there's this one kid. He didn't take. Like, he doesn't talk. He just fucking bow, smack me. I was like, oh, I still remember that motherfucker. You know? so, uh, I was I was very very um, obsessed with martial arts, and then at some point I kind of forgot about it. My my family ne- never put me in school because me and my brother always fought. You know, and um, do you guys have any brothers, siblings that are similar age? I have a stepbrother. Yeah. Um, my brother's one year older than me. And um, it's 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 very different growing up with it one year. A lot of times they say siblings right next to each other. They're almost opposite in character. So I talk a lot. My brother's a quiet guy. And um, he doesn't talk. He just smack you, you know, and it's not a lot of smack. <laughs> like he, he's aggressive, aggressive, right? Like we used to fight all the time. Like at some point we're fighting like almost every day, like, like when I was 12 to like 14 or something. And that's very, very important age, you know, where this is the world you live in now, you know, like uh, it's just, uh, you know, when you're at that age, there's a lot of anger and whatnot, you know? So I was always in fights, you know, and um, I started lifting weights when I was 14, 15, something like that. Never got big, you know what I mean? I tried so hard, but like my body just doesn't want to get big. And then when I was in Canada, I um, I was like, oh, let's research. I just learned martial arts, uh, the word. I was like, oh, let's write martial arts. Let's see what's out there. You know, I thought there was Kung Fu or something. And it was like kickboxing school and uh, MMA school, Lines MMA, shout out. And uh, I just walked down and they were like killing each other. They were sparring. And I thought it's just like, you know, frames and shit. And I was like, oh, man, this is wild. Right away, I registered. I was actually DJing, sold my DJ in the same week. I was training twice a day and I competed like in two months. Um, I got my ass whipped, but, you know, it was good times. I, uh... So with that, I, I when I finished school, I'm always stubborn with my ideas, you know, and I thought, you know what, uh, I need to, um, I, I always wanted business in, in martial arts. So first I wanted to be a fighter. As I progressed, because I started training when I was 24, 25, I was already late. I, but I actually kind of was doing really good in the gym. And I thought, you know what, let me take a shot at it. And then Sage Northcott got signed to the UFC. And when I saw him, I'm like, who the f- how can someone be that jacked? And that, like, <laughs> this is I'm like, I'm not fighting these kids. Fuck that. Because in my <laughs> mind, you either get to the UFC or Bellator or you're dead in the water. Right? Or you're fucking killing yourself in one of the toughest careers ever. Yeah. It is the toughest career. Right? Like, what's tougher than yeah. getting your ass kicked every day in the gym, exhausted and doing the same thing every day? And uh, and I was like, all right, I don't think I got a fight career in here, you know, like I'm not. Uh, so I was like, all right, I'm spending too much time anyways, training and watching videos, you know, I better have something in. I was like, I'm not going to be a fighter, but I'm going to be in the business of fighting. Um, and uh, I always had funny rash guards, like I, I would compete in uh, the hangover t-shirt, you know, with the, with that dude, uh, I forgot his name, naked, stick out and shit. And uh, I always just, I always thought, you know, like if this game is too intense for you mentally, you shouldn't be doing it. You know, some people you find in the gym, they're like, uh, bro, if this is really making you uncomfortable, don't do it. Do something else. You know, this is too much for your mental health. You know, uh, I always thought like, if, 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 this is fun, especially for hobbyists. This is fun, man. Get in there, have fun. You know, if someone is going too hard, you don't want to go too hard, just let them know. So anyhow, so I had that mindset always, like, just fucking, uh, I like funky stuff. And uh, I'm, I'm all about, like, style and comfort, 
it's a big theory, you know, and I, I, I think British people would uh, appreciate it if they try it out because you guys love the tight stuff. Love tight. <laughs> the tighter, the better. I don't know how you live like this. It's so <laughs> I, I, I started there because in the beginning, I used to wear tight shit. It looks good. But I, I was like, I'm not in the groove. You know, I go to the club. I'm like all tied up. I'm like, oh, dude, this is, you know, I, I look good, but I don't feel good. So uh, I was banging out some st- designs. Uh, but first, like I was just wearing some funky shit and I, and I, you know, I liked it. Then I started making my own uh, funky stuff and it picked up, you know, people liked it. And frankly, it's not so much about it picked up. I was just a business ninja, just like literally just went Jackie Chan on that motherfucker, you know, like marketing, uh, sourcing and all that shit. You know, I was working 14, 16 hours a, a day. I literally like 2007, uh, 2015-ish, I had a New Year resolution. I take New Year resolutions very seriously, you know. Uh, and I was like, you know, a New Year, it's not like because of New Year. It's just like it's a good time. Okay, because a year, it's really a week if you look at it, right? Summer is like the weekend. And then you got the, the days, be, like January is like a Monday. You know what I mean? It's like everybody trying to fucking get in shape and start strong, you know? <laughs> so I, I, I like to look at it in accumulation. It's like, what happened last year? What do I need to fix? And I, a couple of things I had in mind. I was out of shape and I needed more money. You know, and I was like, all right, so uh, I want to I want to create a business that is remote, you know, because I wasn't sure I'm going to stay in Canada. You know, I was in visas and stuff. And um, and it has to be in business in uh, in martial arts. Sorry, guys, if I'm ranting, I don't know where this no, no. question <laughs> I had two times today. So, yeah, ex martial as a brand. This is uh, so um, I uh, basically I took it very seriously. I translated. And this is the thing I, I like to tell people, you know, uh, jujitsu and Muay Thai and fighting and whatnot. This is a passion. And because it's so hard, you start figuring out a way to do it better and whatnot. Even if it's so hard, but because you love it, you're willing to put in the work. Yeah. Once you learn how to put in the work in that, now you learn the formula. Pick something else that will fix your life, make it better. And even if it's so fucking annoying, just apply the same formula. Hard work. It will only get better if you do more of it. So that's kind of, I, I went from putting all my time in fighting to just putting all my time in business, but training twice a day. And I competed like two months later. I lost like 20 pounds, which is like, I think, 7 kg or 10 kg. And I fought in two months. A competition came up. I rewarded myself with a... Two tournaments, like Saturday and a Sunday. It was six fights in uh, in a weekend. And uh, and then the business kind of picked up at the end of the year. I just grinded out for a whole year. I was like, I thought if it takes five years, but then it works, boom. And now I'm in yeah. martial arts and I'm, I'm set, you know, like financially I can travel. So, uh, yeah. So X martial kind of started first just like dabbling into – the martial arts space in terms of designs and whatnot. Then I kind of took all that data, what people like and whatnot, and I went full business mode on it in 2020. Um, pandemic hit. I was like, perfect. No one is going anywhere. I'm just going to sit home and make this shit work. You know, and I just <laughs> sat home and I, I just fucking said, I'm not getting up till this thing takes off. You know, and um, uh, it took off and two years later I traveled. So, uh, Yeah. That's class, mate. Yeah, it's cool, man. And and we love the brand. It, it's funny, when we first caught up with Dean, he reached out to us and one of the things he asked was how familiar we all were with the brand. And we we were quite familiar with you, but mostly because we watched some of the guys that you look after, so Jordan and Tyler and those guys. But also because we kept seeing these really quirky rash guards popping up in our gym. So yeah. a couple of the last were in the Only Fans one. There was one that the, uh, I forget the actor's name, but I'm too old for this shit, that design. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think you'd seen the Joe Rogan one, right? The yeah, Joe- the Joe Rogan one. And then the Hillbilly yeah. one always gets me as well. The faux like shorts and t-shirt <laughs> Hillbilly always gets me like... Yeah, so when Dean reached out, it was great because we'd, we'd already kind of looked at some of the rash guards, but... 
But like you say, that there's, you said at the start, there's like a lot of people will just attempt to make a jujitsu brand like at Blue Belt. But yours is like really unique in regard to the style and the how sort of how I guess how bold you are with some of the designs. I mean, were you always that way with the brand? Was that always the intention to be so out there with the different brands and the different rash guards and the and the designs? Man, this is a great question. You know, like uh, I know you guys are part like a jujitsu podcast, but I'm sure everybody in in business in some format, right? Like, and I'm a. I'm in fighting, but I'm in business as well. I know. Uh, mm-hmm. Look, if you want people to remember you, you, you come with a band, you know, come out with a band, like wear something or like looks different. You know, there's this uh, whole picking chicks, um, picking up chicks, uh, teachings or whatever. I don't, I, you know, I'm not very familiar with it, but some people told me you have to be cock and shit. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I know a lot of guys, especially our age, you know, they gone through that education, you know, like yeah. But before before Instagram, that was how you met women, just <laughs> peacocking and then reading the the game or whatever the book was called back in the day. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. It's hilarious, you know. And I love those nerds teaching this shit. It's amazing, you know. Like, you know, so you know. Anyhow, so uh, I never really gone through that process. But let me tell you, you want people to remember you, show up you know, uh, with something a little bit different, you know, and it, it, it gets under people's skin. Don't get me wrong. I, I get in trouble a lot. I got punched in the face, like randomly at a club, you know, or some, <laughs> it's just, sometimes I'm just in some, uh, under someone's skin, you know, it's just, it's like a business cost almost, you know? So, uh, two things. One, uh, like how, how, how uh, we came out with these designs, uh, uh, people remember it. So people ask, what is this? Even if you, like, if you look around in gyms, most rash guards look very similar. Mm-hmm. And that's what people actually like. People like to look, they want to blend in. They don't want to stand out, the average. But the 20% that want to stand out, they attract a lot of attention. So you're not going to look at a random rash guard. You're like, oh, just rash guards. And then boom, this guy, even though you will never wear it, but you looked at it. So now I could buy some real estate in your head. That is marketing, right? When you look at something, you remember it. Now it's in your head, even though you're, you're not going to buy it. If you go write BJJ rash guards, ex marshal pops, you're like, oh, these guys sold that. So it's already validated. You know, someone bought, you know, so... You know, we can go down the business uh, rabbit hole, but the, the, uh, that is an important element. But then we have all these normal designs that people like, because in my opinion, a lot of people like the uh, the a lot more chill, mellow designs and um, uh, a little mysterious. Also, the the like hardcore angry or whatever. I don't know. Like, I don't have the name for him, but like, <laughs> you know, like, like blood. Like, Shit like that you know like people like this stuff too so i'm not like stubborn about like oh this is our shit no we, we are actually famous for our funky shit but we 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 provide whatever it is that the customer wants you know like yeah if the audience wants something uh we make it happen and we optimize it we we, we change and we throw these quirky things on it so when you wear it even though it's chill you still can see this is ex martial, you know? Yeah, it's a really good marketing strategy, really, because obviously you've got a lot of normal stuff, but because a lot of the rash guards are so, like, outrageous, you know what I mean? Like, they are funny. Like, it does attract people naturally. I remember the first time um, I, I, I Googled you, it was just like, uh, I wanted your hillbilly rash guard, and I just, hillbilly rash guard, ex, <laughs> ex martial come up, and then I was just like, about half hour, mate, just looking for all your rash guards and shorts and all the matching <laughs> stuff. And I was like, oh, this is fucking class, mate. This is this. And again, it, it's it done exactly what you said. I can't remember who I seen it. I think I, think I might have seen it on, um, I think that Jedi. Jedi does jujitsu or something like yeah, that. Yeah, Jedi. Jedi is a legend. Uh, when I first started jiu-jitsu, I watched a bit of him and uh, yeah, he had his, his, his hillbilly rash guide on and I was like, I want to check that out. Like, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Because <laughs> I'm that knob, mate, that would wear that. You know, I'm that knob who would wear the hillbilly rash guide, no problem. People love the hillbilly. That was like a very random idea. Very random. 
spot. They love the hellbilly, man. It, it you know because it makes sense, right? You you feel like a hellbilly in there, sweating with all these <laughs> little hands and trying to choke each other and feeding them your yeah. elbow. You know, it's a it's a dirty business we're in there. You know. What are your uh, what are your best selling designs? Do you know? Uh, we, we those designs do really well. The hellbilly and the tuxedo. You know, I oh, the tuxedo, I, I, I like yeah, to roll stuff into my office. You know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And um, uh, we got uh, there is a few the the funky the rainbow stuff. The it's like uh, I was about to say you do like the unicorn stuff and that now, don't you? You know, and and people, things like that. I see a few people. It is funny, mate. I, I, I nearly messaged Dean on the slide to tell him to send you like a unicorn mascot or a t-shirt. Mate, I don't, I don't <laughs> you know, <what> <laughs> I saw it today in ba- Bang um, in uh, Bang Tao. So someone wearing the uh, unicorn and uh yeah it stands out you know we we run up to him and uh checked in with him uh, it's like, like i said you want to do something first slap it on people's face pow you know you can't miss that and then mellow down think yeah. about gym shark gym shark when they started they had the big shark thing and the mm-hmm. thing and it was like a fucking singlet thing you know like <laughs> yeah. so may i remember those old designs they pulls out they pulls yeah. out yeah nipples out yes <laughs> and and now look at them they're very clean right yeah, yeah so yeah. you start yeah. first with a bang like this is the same formula i'm trying to do like with our like dojo road show the way we can approach things honestly it's more of my personality too i'm I, i'm high energy guy and i talk a lot and i i like to joke and i'm just like i like to have fun you know in my my time we're either having fun we're doing business i'm not fucking doing something in the middle you know like <laughs> we're either doing something cool or we're having fun don't waste my time you know what i mean yeah. so when we approach these events like the pgf i know you guys had brandon mccatherin oh man shout out a legend of the sport and if you guys ever get the chance to go to the pgf Check it out, man. Being in the PGF for a week, it was the most fun jujitsu tournament I ever been to, man. It was like action packed, just like people going every five minute, two crazy jujitsu guys just going at it for five minutes and it just keeps going. And if you're going there, like, and, and there's 20 competitors, and let's say five of them is your favorite, you see these five guys compete three times every night. I love that. Yeah, this sick, is what yeah. jiu-jitsu should be. It's not Muay Thai. It's not like you're getting kicked and your elbows and hand is all banged up. Dude, you go to watch jiu-jitsu in Fight Pass. You see your fucking guy kinda, and it might have like a boring ass role with like a match with some other dude that was whatever, right? Uh, it was tall and shit. And that's it. And you're like, bro, you, dr- you flew this guy all the way here. We came all the way to watch this. You know, this is jujitsu. Let these guys, like, that's why in the gym you get, like, ten rolls, right? You get yeah. the five life rolls. Let these guys roll, you know? They're not hurt. Let them roll again. You know, obviously, a week is a commitment to most people, but Eddie Bravo is doing it in Mexico. Amazing vacation. Imagine this. A jiu-jitsu overdose. You go to Mexico. You're in a beautiful resort. If you've ever been to Mexico, go to resorts. I know people, like... I want to go get the experience. Fuck the experience. This is a lot better than, you know, <laughs> go to the resort. And then you get comedy, you get jujitsu, you get seminars, you get all jujitsu guys, your favorite guys hanging out in the resort for a whole week. This is a way to go about it. You know, the, like you just hang out with, with people that have similar mindsets. as you, you know, like they don't have to be like a high level or whatever, but they kind of, they like to fuck around, you know? So, um, uh, anyhow, uh, I don't know what I was with this. I was just asking about the uh, the designs and stuff, mate. But no, it was good. It was a fun tangent. And the other the other thing that you obviously do a lot of as well, and and you know partly why we're speaking to you now, but you obviously get behind athletes and you know and YouTubers and and kind of use that as a way of marketing as well. Was that always like part of the strategy, or is that something you've just kind of evolved into? Yeah, so I'm studying these big brands, you know, Jim Shark and whatnot. Mate, Gymshark is such a good example, isn't they, of doing that? Amazing example. If, if, they're, they're if that isn't a good example, what? Think about this. Gymshark, you've got Adidas, you've got Nike, you've got Reebok. These guys have been in the game for so long. This is a very tough game to break into. 
And then a kid come out of nowhere in 10 years becomes Abdallah. When, when, was, when was Adidas founded? We don't even know who Adidas is. When was it founded? We don't even know. It's like a thing you were born with. Uh, you were born and Adidas as a Nike is like, just like fire and water and shit. You know, they were around. And then this fucking kid came out of nowhere with a business all online behind a computer. So it is possible. The reason why these jiu-jitsu guys are failing because they're doing it as a hobby. They're, mm. they're doing it on the side. They have their thing and then they're doing this and they think it's easy and they sell it to their teammates and they think they have a business. This is not first thing when you, what you, to do when you start a business. You don't you do not tell your friends and family. You don't tell because selling it to people, you know, is extremely limited. Right. Like you think you have a business. You sold it now to the hundred people, you know, you're very popular. You got hundred people, you know. And now that's it. Your business is done. But if you crack the code on selling this product to someone that never heard of your business, it's a code. It's a long formula. But if you crack it, seven billion. You got the whole world. <laughs> You're on the yeah. internet, baby. You know, it's just like having, you know, a store on a street. You're limited to people that walk by. But on the internet, people don't walk by. You're dead. You're just in the dark there, you know, no one will ever see your store. So um, I'm, I'm looking at Gymshark. I'm studying these guys very closely. I'm studying guys that are up and comers now. You know, I'm in that game. You know, I'm in the, mm. in the e-commerce, in the online space, you know, and the marketing thing, you know, and um, I love it. It's a lot more effective than, um, than traditional business. Traditional business yeah, takes so much effort, so much time. You just to get a paper done, like go to the government building, wait there. It's like a whole day gone. What the fuck is that? On the internet, like pop out, done. You know, like a couple of bang up, couple of things. And you can get like, you can literally build a whole store and a brand in a day. Doesn't mean you're yeah. going to sell. In a day, six hours, whole store is up and running. You can take sales. So. Yeah, I always think with um, the podcast when we first started and whatever else, and then when you start getting your subscribers on YouTube in bits and pieces, it always stuck in my head. If one person's willing to subscribe that we don't don't know, then why can't 100,000 100, people do it? Because that one person that's come and subscribed to us doesn't know us, don't any, they like our content. So as long as we're churning out good content over time, over time, it, it, that we're, we're going to get to where we want to get to. And you see it all the time with podcasts. And again, it's probably in the same sort of game as what you're doing, but they, they, they do it for a while and then they just quit because it's not going exactly how they want to. Whereas with us, it's like, no, regardless of how many subscribers we're getting or you know how well an episode does, we don't care. We're like, we've got this plan and we're just going to keep churning out these episodes, keep speaking to better people, keep moving forward. And then what will happen? The subscribers will come then all the other parts of the, the business happen. But if you don't if you don't ever put that, that time in and that effort, like what you said, like you're never going to get there. You're just never going to get there because everyone wants a quick, like just a quick, easy way to get there, you know? People hear about all these like uh, fast wins, you know, like, oh, someone, oh, in two years, it became so fast. These yeah. are extremely rare cases, you know? Uh, real, like, especially when you do, like, in my opinion, First, you got to figure out your money, you know, and money can be really boring, job or whatever the fuck it is. And then once you got that source in, work on a passion project. And even if it takes 10 years, after 10 years, you're good. If 10 years later, you still got 30 years to go. Still a long time. Like, so if you got it, like figured out in 10 years, that is a great achievement and you got so much more time to reap that rewards, right? And the process is always fun, even like, because it's a passion project. You should think about it. This is something I'm doing it because I love it. And if it makes me money, we're fucking great. We're, we're good now too, you know? But a lot of people like chase your passion. Don't fucking chase your passion if it's like making music or something that is extremely hard to get into. Like the, 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 the likelihood of you as a fighter, or athletes, I, I say two things, right? Athletes or artists. To be an artist or an athlete, it's extremely hard to make money, extremely hard, you know? So you gotta know your thing first, uh, you know, make sure you secure that bag 
and then work on your project at the same time sometimes or whatever it takes, mm-hmm. right? But um, it, l- let's say you're a fighter, work on your social media. This is p- part of your business. I don't care. You don't like it, no one cares. You have to do it, yeah. you know? Um, yeah, same thing like with uh, artists and whatnot, you know, like uh, it's, it's tough, man. Now it's very competitive. Uh, the world has become a lot more competitive than what it used to. It used to be like, get a job and you're chilling. You got your friends, you go to the pub, hang out. Good times, you know. Like, now it's like fucking, you do everything right and still you feel behind because the world is moving a lot faster, you know. Yeah, we say that all the time, don't we? We're, we're like, it's, it's just, a, it's just a, everything's just a slow burner and you need to put that effort into to get where you want, you know? And um, yeah, I just, I just, again, I just think so many people just want that instant gratification. They just want to, do it for five minutes, become a millionaire, and then fuck off in the in the sunset. And it's a good point that you made. Like in ten years, if you work on something for ten years and then you eventually make it, that's way better. Like in ten years, you're still gonna if you did, if you give up after six months, that ten years you still you're gonna be exactly the same spot. And we speak about that all the time. The time's still gonna pass, right? The amount of things over the years where I've gonna I, I might do this, but I don't want to because it's gonna take two years. And then five years later, I'm still doing the same thing. I just think three years ago, I would have been done. <laughs> yeah. So I got there in the end, and this is why we're on this path now, but it's so true. And the process, right? Yeah, it's a process for sure. The, the harder it is, the better for you, right? The harder it is, it means you have to problem solve a lot more. And you become yeah. a lot more seasoned with all these difficulties. You know, people, you know, I travel Thailand, Bali and shit, and nerds trying to find themselves, like fucking <laughs> <lots of laughs> hugging each other and shit, stinking. You know, it's like, what the fuck? There is nothing to find, motherfucker. You know, like you're fucking empty. You know, like you you need to make yourself create something first. There's nothing to find. You're pussy. You know, like you you're you're running away from all the challenges, and you're just trying to hug a tree and think you're better than everyone now. You know, eventually you gotta go back to Sweden or whatever the fuck you came from, and be again a fucking nerd. You know, and a loser. So a lot of times, like if, if it sucks, that's good. It's good. It sucks. It means you got to do more. You got to go harder. That competition that you deal with, that's good. It means you got to learn all these skills. You got to get through the whole process. Your confidence as a person comes from facing those difficulties and coming out on the other side. Because now your mind is telling you, you're the man. You got this shit. Done. Now that is real confidence. That is real you're finding yourself. So finding yourself, don't hug a tree. Find something difficult trying to do it. And just keep doing that. And it doesn't have to be, a lot of people go straight into fighting. Great, use fighting, but you don't have to fight. Because fighting is 50-50. If you're losing, it doesn't mean you're bad. It's just the other guy is better than you, you know? <laughs> like, it doesn't matter how hard you train. I see people train today, I'm in Bangtown Muay Thai. Motherfuckers, they're murderers in there oh my god i'm like dude this is a tough game now these guys are fucking they're maybe they're juiced up i'm just kidding. but also they're like because juice and now it's very popular you know like here i think it's it's allowed and i'm like man these guys are on gear and some of them are on, they don't give a fuck they like they come from places where they could have died in a war you know so to them it's like either i either make it as a fighter i'm shooting all this shit or I'm fucking dead. I don't give a fuck, you know? So that's who, you, that's who you're fighting on the weekend. You know what I mean? Like, it's not a fair game. You know, fighting is, is one of the fastest ways to, uh, to build that self-confidence. It's like a hack. A lot of times it takes, for me, the way I look at it, a fight camp, three months, it's almost two to three years of self-development condensed. Because you're just, every day you're waking up, you're fucking sick and tired. You got to go again train hard, diet, you're getting schooled every day. It doesn't matter how good you are. You know, fatigue gets the best. And, you know, uh, every day, you know, like someone is better than you. So uh, pick something difficult, trying to get it done. And that was the way I kind of found myself first. And um, in Muay Thai, I was like, oh, shit, this is it. You know, this is the thing for me, you know, like now – I learned hard work. I never, I thought I was a hard worker, but you never know until you start training. Like you're blue belt, you know what it is, you know, like you start doing jujitsu, you're like, all this workout I was doing, picnic, oh, that was like a warm up. Mate, yeah, that's exactly how I felt when I come into jujitsu. 
it blew my mind, mate. I was like, this is <laughs> discipline. It's everything I probably needed in my life 10 years ago, to be honest with you. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I would have, I would have been flying 10 years ago if I got it then. But, you know, it, it, is, it is brutal. It is brutal. How old it? are you, Danny? 35. 35. You're still in the game, brother. And Paul? I'm 42. <laughs> you know it's so. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are getting there you know how it is you know yeah, now you gotta know, be man. very picky with your shit you know yeah like, for God sure man damn. but mate i think i think it's true that what you say about just doing the hardship i think even with fighting i mean when i was you know in my 20s that was pretty much all i did i did a little bit of mma in my 20s and that was kind of like my whole status at that point i was skin i had a shit job like shit relationships but i was like a bit of a fighter and I, I, I got injured and, and kind of lost that. And at that point, mate, I had nothing else. So I think sometimes if you develop that confidence just through fighting alone, I think if you lose that, whether you get old, retire, get injured, go on a string of losses, whatever it is, I think you still you still risk getting left with nothing or and, and losing that confidence. So I think you're right. You still need to, even if you are a fighter, still do other shit, which isn't as fun as fighting that requires graft and you can take that fighter's work ethic and apply it to other things like you say and, and get that shit done. It was something that a former guest Dan Strauss talked about where he was talking about the status game mm. and that the key to the status game is that you you play multiple games. So you achieve status in fighting, but in business, in other things as well. So if you lose one, you still got the others. Absolutely, man. Jordan uh, teaches, you know, like he's a fighter, black belt and all that. You know, and uh, really good kickboxer as well, you know. But his YouTube now is a big thing, you know, and he took it very seriously. Um, this is the thing about fighters, you know, that's a whole identity. And uh, they almost, because now, you know, I don't fight, you know, I just train and whatnot. And a lot of these guys I see in their eyes are kind of fucking, they're, they, they, they look down at you, you know, when they see you, you're not at their level, you know what I mean? And I'm like, this is your world. I'm in your world. You know what I mean? Like, imagine you come to my world and I'm like, what do you do? You know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> it's a stupid, it's, it's a stupid mentality, you know, like, to have, oh, this is my identity and this is what I'm going to judge people based on how strong they are. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, completely. Dude, it doesn't matter how strong you are if you fucking, you know, if your life and, you know, you're, you're struggling with your relationship, with your mental health, with your finances. A lot of the fighters are like, they have a lot of issues outside of fighting, but they're running away from them and hanging out in the gym. That's their safe zone, you know, because they're better than anyone else there, you know? And it's, it's funny, you know? And it's like, bro, there's so much more in life, you know? And fighting is a very young man's game, you know? And it's, it doesn't last very long, you know? Like, it's not like comedy or singing. You can sing in your 70s, you know, but the spider, you're like, past 40, doesn't matter how good you are. That young gun that is talented is going to cause a lot of trouble, you know? So, uh, yeah, yeah. fighting, it got to be balanced with something else. You got to, like, in my opinion, when you approach, if you approach fighting, you got to look at it very, um, um, uh, in a very specific manner, like, okay, I'm going to try to do one, two, three within that time period, see where I can get. And don't take those examples, Daniel Cormier, who is an Olympian and like freaks of nature and be like trying to apply it to you. You know, I'm not like, you got to have a realistic approach and then an element of risk taking that it's optimistic. But that is like a 10, 20%. You can't like run your whole life based on like an insane luck, you know, like, so you got to like go in fighting, you go hard, you're trying to push within your 20s, you want to find yourself on a path to one of these big organizations. And during that time, you got to really take care of the body and like, and, and, and build yourself in social media because they will look at your social media. Because these guys, even though you're a good fighter, sometimes they don't pick you. You want to talk on the mic, so you practice talking, getting podcasts and, you know, whatever. Just spit out shit. It's going to suck in the beginning. Just do more of it. And then do your social media. Whatever your social media is. You want to you be annoying. You know, you want to be 
racist, whatever you want to be. Just do something in social media, get people talking, you know, and, and trying to carve your way up. And then you got to make big an- assessment because it's a very consuming career. And it's either you kind of see a viable path like fi- for financial. Because at the end of the day, the biggest problem you got to solve in your life is your financial problem. Like at least the basic fi- financial issues. Because your finances could completely ruin your life, right? If, 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 if it's not taken care of. So you, you got to kind of carve your path that way and then make a very hard assessment on like uh, how much finance taken on me and do I have a future in it? You know, and this is obviously my opinion. I could be wrong a hundred times, but this is how I look at it, you know? Yeah, I think it's a really fair assessment, mate. And I think, um, yeah, I think potentially so many people probably just chase that dream for too long without doing anything else and just end up unstuck. So I think it's uh, yeah, a really good assessment. I wanted to ask you about jujitsu specifically, because I think, we're chatting at a really interesting point in jiu-jitsu because I've been around jiu-jitsu for, I don't know, 20 years. So for me, it's always been popular because I've always been in it. But, you know, when multiple people ask me if it was like karate over the years, I realized it probably wasn't that popular. But we're at a point now where obviously you've got CJI, you've got a lot more professional brands. Danny's doing a blue belt uh, 16-man competition for a five grand purse in like in six months time. It's insane. So you've now got a lot of money coming into the sport uh, you've got obviously ADCC making massive spa- spectacles. You've got Brendan doing his thing with the league. So it's a really interesting time. So as a businessman, as a, as a, as a marketeer, like what's your assessment of jujitsu at the moment as a sport? Oh man, you got, you got me excited here, you know, cause I'm balls deep now into it. Like, uh, trying to gain that space, you know, and I love combat jujitsu. You know, I feel, uh, this is like, uh, uh, Eddie Bravo's, uh, favorite son, you know, combat jujitsu. <laughs> He's really, really passionate about it. And his passion translated in to me, you know, and I, I thought like, why is he so crazy about this thing? You know? And then I thought about like jujitsu. I'm like, how can we make, cause I've been trying to figure out a way. How can we make jujitsu popular? Mm. I love jujitsu, great sport, but it's hard to watch. Yeah, and, um, I, agree. I think the best format we got now is uh, PGF. The best format, the best format, like hands down, in terms of story, drama. Think about this. These guys are competing against each other for a week. S- drama starts building up because a <laughs> show, the sport is like the, you know, after this is 20%, 80% is the characters. If you like these guys, you want to see how they do things. Like Danny now is getting the 5,000, right? Uh, and I think it, it must have something to do with the podcast or something. This is not random blue belts for 5,000. No, no. So so Danny Danny maybe got the gig because of the podcast, but there's loads of other competitors that are just blue belts who are just on the UK like scene. Best, yeah, they've won a lot of shit, mate. They, they, they're literally it's trying to find out basically who's the best blue belt in the country. I love it. It's actually a, a catchy title. It's a thing. It's, yeah. it's a thing. It's it's not it's not our thing. It's not something we've put together. It's uh <laughs> it's called it, uh, Ikigai. Ikigai. It's yeah, called. it's up, it's up north in Manchester. So uh, it's uh, it's a Andy Aspinall black belt who's putting it together. Who's doing this? Steve Stephen Henshaw. He's called. I would lo- I want to I want to connect with the, with a the guy because this yeah, we'll is, hook you up. That is a spark man. Blue belts yeah, mate, are yeah. a lot greater market than brown belts and black belts. Oh, They're 100%. one of the most passionate market. You know. Mm-hmm. That, that's our market blue belts you know blue belts they're 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 fresh blood they just got in the game they're flexible in terms of ideas they're funky uh they are 80 percent of the market i mean yeah. if you if you have a show uh best blue belt you throw that on youtube what do you think gonna happen oh mate i i completely agree we've i said this to you didn't i i was like so many people be interested to see you know what I mean? Because some of these lads, I was saying, I text Paul yesterday, one of the lads, he's won like everything. He looks like, he looks 18. He looks like he's barely got a pube. He looks 14. Uh, he looks 14. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't look like he's got a pube, mate, but he's like fucking everyone up. And I was just like, bet this motherfucker is going to ruin me. You, you know what I mean? <laughs> he's like 70 kilos wet through and he's going to, he's going to, he's going to heel hook me in 20 seconds. But. <laughs> Bro, that's a, that, uh, wait, heel hooks are loud? Any any submission, it suits me though. Damn. That suits me massive. Pro yeah. rules, man. Pro rules, yeah. You got to tap early, bro. These kids now with their <laughs> fucking 
heel hooks and shit, man. This shit is disgusting. Like, I don't think they should allow in blue belts, but like they they should they should like people should tap fast, man. Because I seen these kids yank legs, just go like they wrap their hand, and then they don't just. It's just like full extension. I'm like, bro, what the <laughs> fuck is going on? You saw that that kid on Eddie Bravo's uh, 10th Planet gym. I forgot the name of the kid. He's a big kid. Oh, the the um. Oh no, you're not about it. Like he's a bit of chunky boy, like chunky lad, and he yeah. he's like bre- been breaking legs. What's he called? He looks is he like Asian or something? I know you're not about it. He's a big chunky lad. He's like 16. He's been breaking all adults' legs and shit yeah. in competitions. Yeah, I can't think of what he's called as well. In 10th Planet, like, this is a, not friendly. They're, like, qualifying for a tournament. So it's 10th Planet versus 10th Planet. And this kid took four guys' legs. And these, Mate, he's a savage. And, <laughs> and these injuries, man, they're, like, life-changing injuries, you know? Like, you never recover 100% when, when your knee pop that hard. Yeah, Because his yanks was fucking insane. So I like that, you know? Um, and this is good for TV, maybe, you know? Like, I think Blue Bell <laughs> are great for TV. You know, like in terms of uh, movement and such. Because when you look at the sport, we have the, 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 we have people like Brandon who are like legends of the sport and they're extremely, call it, open-minded. Open-minded. But then we got like uh, a lot of people up there that are uh, closed-minded in terms of like, mm. we are not having a jiu-jitsu tournament. We're having a show. The show has jiu-jitsu in it. Well, that's why um, CJR was so good, wasn't it? CJR was yeah. so good because it was a show. It was story. It was Gabby Garcia versus Craig. It was it was all of it, wasn't it? And the pit was great and just yeah, it's exactly what you just said. It's, to, it's that. The, the rules has to the rules have to almost fit in there. The mm-hmm. rules have to uh, be narrowed down to like make it action packed and a lot more uh, uh, a lot more drama than. Uh, than 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 a, than a normal sport. In my opinion, as a sport athlete, you like this is just business kind of landscape. I'm looking at it. When you're competing in the beginning, you're competing who's better at jujitsu. But when you're getting on shows, UFC and whatnot, now you're a part of a show. So you gotta talk on the mic. No one gives a fuck how good your jujitsu is. Do not try to claim big numbers of cash. Your jujitsu pay you. As jiu-jitsu purely and, and as sport, who you can bring to the seats. Uh, mm-hmm. And you're not worth a million. You know, like a lot of people like, oh, some people are making millions in the UFC. Why don't I? You know, like I'm, I'm a better fighter than them, but I'm in this organization. I'm not making this money. It doesn't matter. You, your, your skill has not, no, like your fight skill has no association with this. It's really the audience. You've got to get the audience in there. The promoter, his job is to get people to watch and pay, and then the athletes get paid. So as an athlete, and I don't know if athletes would like this uh, description, but you're a product. I have a store. In the store, I have products. And then we have winning products. Winning products attract people, and they buy them. So they're more valuable, call it. So as an athlete, you're a character. The more you add to your character in terms of like, the way you speak, your skill level, even if you annoy people, whatever it is, you got to have a thing. Now, if that attracts people and now they want to see you win, lose, whatever it is, now you're a lot more valuable. And that's how you get paid more. So a sport is a sport in the beginning, but then it becomes a show. And the show has to make rules to create a a spectacle, uh, the word, right? Yeah. That people want to pay to watch. So athletes got to understand this. And a lot of jujitsu guys, they're like kind of annoyed because they're better in their skill and whatnot. And, they, and they're like, they're not getting picked up in certain shows and stuff like that. And they're not taking care of their social media. You chose that path. This is the path you chose. And the, 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 um, uh, the things this path needs is a bunch of shit. And, and obviously the core is your skill, but then you got the other things that you got to pick up throughout the way. Yeah. So do you think this is what jiu-jitsu needs as a sport then? Because I think we've obviously got the tradition of jiu-jitsu, haven't we, with the IBJJF and the gi and the, you know, the respect and everything else. But it sounds like what from, from what you're saying, we need to be, we need to see more athletes and more shows promoting 
maybe slightly you know controversial or, or arguably bad behavior to really sell the show absolutely and i'm I, I, we're we're looking at shows we are definitely going to do some shows in the next i would say two years you know uh my my current thinking is is a combat sport a combat jiu-jitsu kind of show because what combat jiu-jitsu provide is highlights yeah you can get some sick highlights that you can promote the next show it's very hard to get highlights of a regular show to the average casual fan or audience you can get a good highlight for a jiu-jitsu guy like for example we have uh Nick Ortiz, a great back taker, you know, and a very fun, flashy back taker. And anybody that does jujitsu, to get someone's back, this is the ultimate goal, right? This is the ultimate position. You're like, you know, you, so he's really good at taking backs and it's a very hard thing to do. And he makes it look really good. And he's very popular in the jujitsu community. But if you show this to someone that doesn't do jujitsu, I think they still like it because he got some sick highlights. And the guy's shredded and all that. He got the other stuff as well. But um, combat jiu-jitsu, you can get those knockouts and those crazy like blood things and shit like that. So that element, this is that little product that you get at the very end, few seconds, is what promote next shows. So you take this, you take characters, you show the blood and the mess, you show these characters they're crazy, now you get people interested. Now people want to see that next event. Think about this. If you see two people fighting, you're walking the street, you, you see two people fighting far. You're like, ah, oh, shit, so, some people fighting there. And then you notice one of them is your neighbor or someone you know. You're like, oh, shit, let me see what happens. Because now you're, <laughs> you have one more level of investment. You know them just a little bit more. If it's your friend, you're jumping in there. Right? If you watch someone talks like Danny in a show, you know, for a few months, you're like, oh, I, I want to see how he would yeah. behave in a, in that chaotic environment. Like how would he, you know, react in a fight? You know, it becomes not so much about his skill. It's just like the curiosity about what that person reactions would be. You know, even like you would be interested in him singing, you know, people are interested in Connor taking a shit. Connor can do whatever the fuck he wants. You know, like especially at his peak, he could have done anything. People yeah. would come here, right? So the more you watch someone, and that is a real state here. You're trying to equify the more real state you have in people's head, Andrew Tate, Andrew Tate just hammering shit at people, right? And then love him or hate him, he is in your head. He already won, you know? So... The more you occupy in their real estate, the more they want to know about you, especially in a crazy scenario, a fight, court case, um, you know, maybe even a business venture, you know, like mm -hmm. a cryptocurrency like he did. So uh, I want to I want to I want to do something in combat jujitsu and uh, I'm probably going to do it somewhere in Mexico or Thailand, like less rules. I love Thailand. You got all the fighters here and you got all these crazy, you know, Russians and whatnot. These guys don't give two shits. They go through hands anytime, you know? So you could like literally just sign them up. You should do it as a show, mate. It'd be so fucking cool. Oh, dude, that would be... Mate, put me in, put me in. I'll, I'll fight, I'll, I'll smack some black belts, mate. Don't worry. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I'll just fucking hit them. Don't worry. Give me a Russian. <laughs> Let's go. Yeah, man. But when you see him, you'll change your mind. I don't know, mate. <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't mind being it. <laughs> I've trained in Thailand, mate. They hit different. They hit different. <laughs> when you see this dude, no mustache, just beard. Yeah. This guy's not trying to get laid. He doesn't give two shits about style. You know what I mean? He's yeah. trying to smack a bitch, you know? Like, the, 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 these guys are scary, man. I see them around now and I'm like, bro, you can't take... You, so you, they don't get the jokes we, we throw around, you know? So I'm thinking combat jiu-jitsu, maybe Thailand, get those highlights, really show, make it a show. I'm not... This yeah, is not... Could, yeah. Like, the, in my opinion, the way even I'm going to produce it, it's going to be life, but then... It's going to be a YouTube show that it's like almost 20 minute or like even 40 minute, whatever it is. But every person before they we show their fights, you will see 
their background, um, their interview and such, just like the UFC does it. Because, you know, a lot of times you, you're watching some fights and you don't know some fighters. But then their interviews, you're like, ah, oh, now I'm interested. I yeah, see I like this you guy, know yeah. where this guy come from. You heard a couple of problems he has. Now you're connecting at a human level. That's what we need. This is what the sport needs. The sport yeah. needs more attention on the fighters, not just their fights. Show their, like, the, um, uh, Daisy Fresh. Yeah, Daisy Fresh. Yeah, man, yeah. Great example. Good show. Dude, it doesn't cost much making these shows. You know, it doesn't cost much. Like, we did our show. It's half ass or whatever, but it's a great show. We did it for our iPhones and such, and we got, like, our editor does TikTok uh, um, videos. We showed him Dana White looking for a fight. We said, make us a show like this. And we just bounced. And he just had to pull up himself. <laughs> yeah. Good luck, buddy. And this is one of those things. You put a problem. You're trying to overcome it. Throughout that process, you'll become a better person. He's a better editor. And um, it's a great show for us. But, yeah, I, I think we need, we need more characters. We need more attention on their story and their problems and their personality, no mm -hmm. matter what their style is angry, depressed, over the top, whatever it is, show more. Because there's always a segment of audience for anybody. You know, all, all characters or all personalities have a pocket of audience that would be interested in. Yeah, for sure. If you could, uh, if you could select any athlete from jiu-jitsu, from MMA, from power slap to have in this show, who would like your top three or five athletes be? I mean, Craig Jones would be like an easy pick because that <laughs> yeah. really figure it out. He, he knows this. He knows exactly that. B team, number two, whatever, whatever. He doesn't give a fuck about being the best. He's just like, hey, I'll just piss you off. <laughs> then you want me more. <laughs> um, let me think. Uh, dude, we got like, we, we got a few like really fun characters. Like we got uh, Jabroni, Elijah. You heard of him? No. Our Elijah Car Car Carlton is the uh, PGF champion for like four seasons. And um, he got a lot to say, you know, like he's pissed off at everybody, <laughs> you know, and he loves to let, he, he likes to let people know. Um, I like AJ, AJ Agazar. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, th this guy is a wild, wild card, you know, like you never know what he's going to do. And um, a lot of these guys actually, you, you, sometimes you don't know their character, but the PGF is a perfect tournament that puts these knuckleheads together for a week. And then you start, they start like fighting each other in the backstage <laughs> and all that. So it's a perfect environment to actually like show these guys characters, you know, on at that, um, with that intensity, you know, in that tournament style. So, uh, I learned a lot from the PGF. I feel like, um, their style is really good to show these characters. But yeah, AJ, AJ probably is a cool guy. Um, there are a few guys they know, They like Nick Ortiz. I know he got a lot uh, personality-wise, but he's keeping it like, um, he's focused a lot more on his skill now uh, as a jiu-jitsu player, you know, but I, I think he could like just get on the mic and just talk some shit, you know, but... Uh, I'm sure, like, the way I'm going to be picking guys, it's, it's not going to – I'm obviously going to pick guys that are high level, like yeah. uh, Andy Varela kind of guy, yeah. you know. He's, he's great, like, for – like, his skill is up there, but then his personality is also – he's out there too, but throw the mic at this guy more, you know. Let him talk more, you know. Yeah. Uh, because I know he got a lot there in the tank as well. So we would probably like, I'm going to be a lot more on the show side than it's a jiu-jitsu. Because I'm not a big jiu-jitsu guy. I love jiu-jitsu, but I'm not like a jiu-jitsu head, you know, like. So for me, I want to see guys just smack talking each other and then just getting out there and trying to do, go for back takes and takedowns and such. Like, I'm going to be scoring a lot on takedowns. And uh, I'm trying to figure out, like, the best. Because I like the the bomb on the ground. But I feel like we need to incentivize them to, to have more action on the, on their feet as well. So maybe yeah. point with 
with the with the strikes. We'll we'll see. What what's what, what who are you thinking? You got a few guys in mind, Paul. Yeah, I, I don't know, man. I was just I was just curious, but I think what you probably need is like I don't know, like a PGF style format, so like a league. I think maybe like an athlete house, like the Army Fire or Power Slap or something. <laughs> yeah, that's. A I think maybe like a CJI Alley and maybe rule set, and then just a load of lunatics, mate. Basically, and I think oh, you got a show and money to put in, as yeah, in like yeah. big prize, because then it's then that's what will get everyone going crazy for it, yeah. you know. And that's that's why I think X March like you were talking about like us getting involved with athletes and influencers mm-hmm. and such. Mm. You know, we are like I'm a huge fan of the sport and the personalities in it. You know, yeah. I'm a, like a lot of the people I'm I'm fanboying, like no one knows about these guys, but I'm like I'm a huge fan because I'm very curious about psychology and fighting and all that, you know, because there is no bullshit in, in fighting, you know, like it, it's so intense. And everybody that's involved, winners, losers, and all that, I respect them very much, you know, because it takes a lot to get in there, you know, like, and do what these guys do. So I'm a huge fan of this sport. And one of the main things I did when I uh, had my company, I was um, sponsoring all kind of guys, all kind of guys, like, just so happy I'm in the space, you know, and so happy that... I'm involved now, you know, and I actually can give back, you know, and I'm not like a big charity crazy guy or whatever, you know, but, you know, I, I like to, uh, I like to do my part or whatever. Right. And, um, uh, I'm thinking like with that tournament, this, that would be a great way to do it. You know, like create a tournament, really trying to make it some, make, make it something big and then that money goes right back in the community. And if people don't like combat jujitsu after they see the money, they will be like, all right, now we got something. And I feel with what we have, like we already got brand and a lot of these guys starting tournaments, basically they're just throwing money and hoping it works. You know, um, we are already in the, in the business, you know, so there's a lot more utility for us to have, a tournament and a competition like we can uh we can call it monetize it a lot better yeah so um we are really looking at uh creating events and a tournament we want to make him a lot more no stadiums none of that shit it's going to be in the gym it's going to be completely uh specific for video you know like for filming yeah it's yeah. not like um, yeah it's not audience thing we'll have people but and it will be fun, you know. We'll throw some weird shit and and just make it a little more weird and quirky, just like what Craig Jones did, you know. There and you know, this guy's. Yeah, it sounds great, man. And I think I think you're onto something with the with the personalities because some of the the, the craziest, most interesting people you, you ever meet are going to be around jujitsu and fight gyms. It's kind of why we ended up, a, a, you know, as the grapplers perspective. We started off as the everyday perspective, and we were kind of focused more on men's health and lifestyle, but. As we went through and when, as we went on, it just all the interesting people we knew uh, were just jujitsu guys. So we just ended up talking about jujitsu. I was saying it for ages when I was like, we just got to go down this rabbit hole, mate. Yeah. I was like, because we were just, I just, I just find it way more interesting. You know, I just find it way more interesting. And a lot of these guys, like you said before, like they have so much life experience and, and the things that they talk about because they've been through such like shit times through you know, getting chinned in the in the rings and you know putting themselves out there. You know, they they got such fucking amazing stories, and then they 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 do well in business and they do well in other aspects of their life. And it's just interesting to hear. You know, these top guys when they talk about you know how they give up everything, it always sticks in my mind. So many people were like, "Oh, how did you get to where you are?" And they're like, "Well, I just you know give up everything. I moved to a different country on my own, and I just." went for it and I slept on a floor or, you know some crazy story and you think how the fuck have they done yeah, that but I think even like the normal people you meet who just have everyday lives but use jujitsu to maybe manage like some sort of shit some sort of PTSD they've got going on from their life and <laughs> through being humbled in and being creative in, in jujitsu and martial arts it, they, they then can express themselves like they've never been able to so you just yeah get some amazing conversations out of people it's really cool yeah, man, and ego checked, right? Like, um, mm. you, you get your ego checked every time. In, in <laughs> every- fighting. Yeah, and, and you're a lot more chill, right? Like, jiu-jitsu guys are a lot more relaxed, you know, and, and fighters in, gen- in general, in general, right? Like, uh, but uh, generally, I, at least for me, uh, the way I feel, like, 
I could be tense, pissed off, panicky and freaking out. And then I go to the gym, I get my workout in or, you know, and then I leave and I'm thinking, man, my problems are still the same, but I feel a lot better. Like nothing changed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I haven't nothing improved changed, yeah. my life in any way, but I feel so much better. So, and I, I feel a lot more um, open, you know, like a lot more relaxed, you know, and I feel like that's what most people need. Most people need uh, uh, an intense workout, an intense environment, and uh, get it, you know, basically uh, get the edge off and then go out and fucking hug it out, you know, and just understand it's all in your head, you know, like. Sometimes you just leave and you're so fucked. You just don't care about other shit, do you? You know, you've just been, you've just been chinned for an hour, you know, and then you get out there and you're like, oh, it don't matter. I'm just tired. <laughs> I'm just tired. <laughs> yeah. I got the ass, whatever. <laughs> Mrs. is mad at you. Yeah, it's all right, love. What do you want? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. You just don't it's care, so do true, you? Yeah, it's, like, it's so fucking true though, isn't it? Like, you just don't care. You're just like, yeah, whatever. Yeah, I used, to, I, I used to be like a lot more um, nervous about interviews and things like that, like uh, with work and such. And then when I started training and, and competing, I was like, man, this is so easy. You just sit there and chat shit with some other guy, you know, like you're not cornered and getting smacked, you know, like and kicked and you know what I mean? And, and honestly, <laughs> the worst about fighting is not really the physical, it's the fatigue. Yeah. The worst about fighting is the fatigue. Yeah, yeah. When you're fatigued and you still got to push every time, that mental shit, once you get off it, you know, you're like, oh my God, thank God, this shit was fucking annoying. You know, like I was, I just did uh, two classes, Jiu Jitsu and Muay Thai. And man, I was out of it. I was like, oh, I'm so glad this is done. But right when it finishes, you're like, man, I feel so much better. You know, like during the shit, you're like, fuck, I, why? I hate this. You know, like, why is this so hard? You know, but right after you're like, oh, that's why I do it. You know, because if I don't do it, I'm fucking pissed off. You know, and like. We're going to go train out in uh, Texas and B team. Uh, we had Dima on the podcast last week. And he's invited uh, invited us out to go and, and train with them for a couple of weeks. And that's exactly what I'm expecting. I'm going to do a camp before I go out just so I'm fit enough to try <laughs> yeah, and keep up. This the other day, yeah. I was like, I'm just going to get wrecked out there. Fucking Nicky's going to ju- dump me on my head 500 times, isn't he? You know? <laughs> <laughs> we pulled up on B team. We pulled up on him in the RV, you know. And uh, uh, Craig Jones was there. You know, he always gets ambushed by jiu-jitsu nerds you know uh, he doesn't like him you know like he, he doesn't like he, he's like just get these guys off me you know and you can feel it like you know jiu-jitsu guys are very uh fanboy you know like yeah hey what's up you know and like no one <laughs> like a famous jiu-jitsu guy no one knows about him but no. in the world of jiu-jitsu like he's so famous you know these guys spending hours every day watching this guy sweat so <laughs> Uh, we saw him outside. We said, what's up? And then we circled. They were like, fuck off. Don't fucking park here. You know, go park somewhere <laughs> else. And then we spin around. We park in the front. And uh, our DA was training there. And um, our DA comes out with all his Brazilian team. They see the RV. They're like, hey, what's up? And we we bring them all in. They're all hanging out in the RV. And... Uh, it was the craziest thing, man. RDA is a legend. This guy's been fighting in the UFC for like 15 years or something. Mm. You know? <laughs> like, uh, uh, he was there a long time ago. And uh, I saw him once in LA, you know, and I didn't want to bother him. It was with his family. And I got a lot better um, time with him when he, uh, yeah, he hang out basically, you know? And this is the thing. You go to Austin, you got to meet a lot of these guys. Like, yeah, Austin yeah. A blue belt in Austin, bro. You gotta, you you're gonna get checked there. Blue belts in Austin, are like brown belts. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna it's gonna be fun. I'm glad, like I've uh, I've been taking my jujitsu seriously for like the last well since I started really, but oh, it's gonna, it's just gonna be fucking hard, isn't it, mate? But again, I'm doing it because it'll give me a good experience before I go to this comp. Because anyone in that room is gonna beat me up way more than any fucking person at that comp in my head, you know. Competition is throwing you on your toes, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. And like, you know, even when Dima and Owen Jones, they come to, and done a seminar and bits, and I, I had a little role with Dima. Man, he's so good. He is fucking ridiculous. 
he is he, he leg locked me like four times in five minutes like <laughs> just he's even like like careful as he's got the lock in like about to break my knee like and i'm like fuck me man this is like it's just different level it's just different level again isn't it it's it's you know and again he's like you know he's hanging with those guys but he's not even you know in the in their league effectively is he you know competitively you know you think fuck me how good how good is uh how good is nicky and craig and all them lot you know yeah craig is, is probably like Craig is up there, man. Like, he's not just, uh, he's, he, like, if it wasn't maybe for um, Gordon or whatever, right? Like, he would be, mm -hmm. like, probably considered number one or something right now. Yeah, well, I was, I was thinking this. Obviously, CGI and, and Nicky won the million. But do you think Nicky would have won if Craig was competing? Bro, Craig is... Do you know what I mean? Dead. I was thinking this the other week. I was like, fuck me. If, if he actually was competing, would he have won his own million? <laughs> <laughs> well, this is jiu-jitsu gossip. I don't want to get in trouble, but I think Craig would win. I think Craig yeah. would win, man, because uh, 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 Nick is very strong and he, mm. he would toy you around, but Craig can submit you in so many directions. You know, well, like, that's what they all say, don't they? They call him the, the gym spaz, mate. Like we've got a load of clips coming out where we've had a few of the B team guys now. We've had like Ethan and Jay and Owen and Dima now. And they all categorically say he's the worst person to train with because he'll <laughs> be so lazy. And then all of a sudden he's ripping your arm off, you know, <laughs> and they're all like, he's an absolute fucking art hard to, uh, to, to train he's with. He's strong. He's strong, bro. Like a lot of people, because you look at Craig, you're like, oh, he looks fit and why not he's way stronger than he looks and he, and he got that jiu-jitsu strength too you know and he's yeah. bigger than you think yeah. he is he's like six one or six two yeah he's big uh so uh, craig is 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 a uh, uh, craig is really saving uh, jiu-jitsu now in terms of like uh like a character that people yeah watch and enjoy you know like and whatever he does they will follow so it's nice having Craig doing what he does, you know, and now, even though like he crosses all kind of lines with everyone, uh, you know, including his teammates, you know, but I think he's doing it purposefully and he's Australian. Australians, that's all they do. They just fuck with you, you know, and, and English guys do as well. But well, that's Australian. what we were saying. That's what, well, that's why I think we, we get him so much because all, all we, we were just sarcastic, mate. So everything we say, we most of the time don't mean, you know, we was talking earlier about like ripping on ginger people and how Americans can't understand. Like if you call someone a ginger dickhead or ginger, whatever, or, or you know, your mum ripped the fox or whatever we go and say um, <laughs> when we was at school. Um, but if you say that in front of an American, they think you really like hate the guy. Whereas in England, it's like a term of affection. It's like, I like him. I'm cool. I'm saying that to him. You know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah, and it's yeah, the same with yeah. Australians, though, isn't it? That's what they're like. They just take the piss constantly. Like mo nothing Craig, nothing Craig oh. says he actually means. He's just he's just taking the piss. But you see a lot of the time Americans will be like, I can't believe you said that. That's outrageous. Yeah, <laughs> yeah he, he doesn't. He doesn't like no, nothing serious out of Craig. You know, like he's always just taking a piss. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's funny. So did he? Did he come on the show? No, not yet. We haven't had him on yet, but he's he's traveling loads, isn't he? So he's um, what's he doing? He's out in Colombia with some couple of females at the moment, I imagine. So. You got you gotta have him on the show, and I don't think it's uh, he's 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 hard to get to. You know, like you just you just gotta accommodate with his schedule. You know, like yeah. the guy is all over the place. You know, uh, like like if you the, the he, he's gonna bring a lot of eyes, man. Like the guy's fun. And people love to hear him talk. So uh, you got to have him on the show. You yeah, gotta, yeah. we will. I think with like him and, and even Nicky Rod as well, we're, we're hoping to get those guys like in the city, in the studio, like around the table with us. I think the dynamic and the conversation is, is sometimes way more fun that way. But but maybe in the interim, we get him virtually and then aim to get him again face to face. Yeah. Or, we do a, or we do a podcast tour and get him all on. Yeah, that's it. We'll jump in your RV and go find him, mate. How about that? Yeah, follow follow his tr travel, right? Like he he's gonna be in England at some point. Yeah, you know, just no, it, once yeah. he's in England, just lock him in. You know, like how far are you from London? About three hours. Yeah, not far. Yeah, and you know, yeah, it's uh, he, he's a fun character. Uh, Nicky Rod is really huge. I think Nicky Rod is probably the number one guy now that Gordon is. I don't know where Gordon is. 
you know, it looks like he's dealing with a lot of stuff. Uh, but Nicky Rod is like he was causing trouble before with Gordon, and now Gordon is, you know, health wise, whatever. So Nicky Rod could be that guy now. He's the number one guy in terms of uh, killing everybody, you know, like no one can stand in front of him. Mm, yeah, 100%. So yeah, we've got plenty of good uh, good ideas for for conversations, man. So watch this space. Let's see if Nicky Rod does MMA. That would be cool. I don't think so. I don't think so. Maybe yeah, Jiu Jitsu is going to get too big, and he's going to go. That's what I think it is. I remember Gordon talking about that a few years ago. He was like, "Why would I get punched in the head when I'm making millions in Jiu Jitsu?" I think Nicky Rod said it recently. He's a, he's a Jiu Jitsu millionaire. Why would he get punched? It makes no <laughs> yeah, sense. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, man, it's been fun chatting to you. Though we'll, we'll let you go in a second, mate. But is there anything you want to tell our audience about about you or Ex Marshall? We've obviously talked a ton about the stuff that you've got in regard to ideas. But anything you want to finish with? Well, Ex Marshall. We saw rash guards and shorts. If you guys like those, you know, go to the store, check him out. I'm doing the uh, Kanye West, you know. Uh, you saw that Kanye West uh, uh, ad on on the Super Bowl? No, I think so. <laughs> oh, dude, he bought a slot in the Super Bowl for two million. Oh no, I have seen this. I have seen this. Yeah, yeah he recorded a video of him in the car. Like, hey, it's yay here. And it was like all messy and shit. Like it was dark. It's like I put two million on this, you know, slot, but uh, I got shoes, you know, go check them out. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. But again, uh, though, yeah, that's marketing you know, genius, man. Yeah, yeah. That, that guy knows what's up, you know, you know. I'm, I'm going to follow his footsteps. But, you know, ex martial A, I think people know us up if, if they're in a the game in jiu-jitsu. And um, we got good shit, you know. And honestly, we're not just like a rash guard and shorts. Everybody can do that, you know. We're completely immersed in this shit, you know. Like, we have a show now. I'm here in fucking Thailand about to do another thing, you know, like a Dojo Rocho Thailand kind of addition. Um we want to have these tournaments, you know, we have all these athletes we're sponsoring, you know, we're trying to like, we are trying to grow uh, or, or um, help the game grow, you know, like the whole fight game, you know, I, I feel like fighting is good for everybody, you know, just, you don't have to compete, just fucking train, push your lungs, you know, and um, if people just give it a shot, you know, I think it will make people a lot more friendly. You know, and a lot more ego checked. Um, so uh, we, you know, I'm 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 very involved in this kind of mission of like getting the sport, making money in the sport, and putting it right in the sport, and and create fun products out of it. You know, like obviously Rash Garden Shorts is one, but then the show, then events, you know, and tournaments, and then the sponsorships and whatnot, and then mix them up all together and kind of see what that have, and it's like it's a fun thing i'm doing it out of passion you know i love this thing and i'm glad there's people like you guys also like grinding on the other side you know doing the media stuff and bringing people on and all that you know we need all this you know we need all this drama you know we need personalities out there and just yeah. people putting themselves and people hearing each other and love hate whatever we want but let's fucking talk you know let's let's not be strangers yeah yeah, man, love that. And again, mate, we really appreciate your support and we look forward to, to kind of speaking to you again and working with you moving forward. But thank you very much again for coming on today, mate. It's been nice to meet you. Cheers, mate. Thank you. Bye, man. Thank you, Ball. Thanks, Danny. I, I, you know, had fun in this uh, podcast, let me say. 